views. Um, I'll start out just going over some of what I think are the harder spots, um, so you'll get a chance to hear it again. Um, and then we'll just go on and we'll do some review questions to get your, your brain working. All right. So probably the most <laughs> physiologically challenging uh, section of this exam three is that first chapter, that neural tissue, where we talked about uh, membrane potentials, action potentials, and that kind of stuff. So just as a reminder, um, the sodium and potassium are not equally distributed in the body. So sodium is mostly outside of the cells, and potassium is mostly inside of the cells. Now, all told, there's about the same amount of each, sodium and potassium. They're just oppositely distributed. So because of diffusion, when um, if the sodium out here is high and the sodium in here is low, when you open sodium channels, sodium goes rushing into the cell, right? And because sodium has a positive charge, as it comes into the cell, the inside of the cell becomes more and more positive. So we call that depolarization. Um, because normally, the cell membrane sits there at about minus 70. So let's see where can I draw this out. So we got minus 70, minus 90, and then plus 30. So that's kind of the spectrum. So this is resting, right, at minus 70. If we open sodium channels, sodium comes rushing in, and the membrane potential goes up to about plus 30. So if all the sodium channels are open, that's where we'll be, is at plus 30. Now, potassium is the opposite. If you open potassium channels, potassium goes rushing out, because potassium is much higher inside the cell than outside. So when it can move, potassium is going to go this way. Um, so if sodium makes things go up, as the positively charged potassium exits the cell, the inside of the cell is going to become more negative, right? Because positives are leaving. So this direction is always potassium. So when the cell depolarizes, that sodium. And when it repolarizes or hyperpolarizes, um, we, that's potassium moving, all right? So the resting membrane potential of minus 70, it comes about because of a kind of balance. Sodium is always leaking in. Potassium is always leaking out. So because of that, the resting potential is, is neither sodium's potential nor potassium's potential. So it's at minus 70. Um, and then from there, we have uh, the, the process of action potential generation. Okay. So in order, a neuron is an all or nothing creature. In other words, it's either going to fire an action potential or it's not. And that determination of whether it will or will not happens right here, where the axon joins with the cell body. We call that area the hillock. And it's the membrane potential at the hillock that's going to determine whether an action potential happens or not. So when this region right here gets to minus 60, it's going to trigger that sequence of events that we call an action potential, which we're going to talk about more in just a second. So the, uh, the way that axon hillock is uh, stimulated is by other neurons. So here's an axon from one neuron. Here's an axon from a second. Now, working together or even in opposition, they're going to change the membrane potential in this area right here, in that initial segment, as we call it, or the, at the axon hillock. And depending on how all those pluses and minuses work out, it'll either trigger, it'll cross that stimulus and start an action potential, or it won't. All right. So if we look at a, uh, a piece of an axon, you know, here's, here we'll say this is our cell body, right? And then we have this long process like this called the axon. So here's the axon hillock that we were just talking about. Well, if we look at just one piece of membrane here, we see this pattern. So when an action potential is moving from here down to the synapse, at each um, section of the axon, we'll see this same pattern. So we have... Uh, four basic parts. At part number one, this is where the uh, neuron is reaching threshold. 
you know, here's the minus 70 resting potential, right? Well, to get those sodium channels to open, we have to get the membrane to minus 60. So in order to do that, we've got to get some additional positive charge inside the cell to get to that minus 60. Now, uh, at the beginning of the action potential, at the axon hillock, this is that uh, uh, depolarization um, stimulus that we were just talking about, the IPSPs and EPSPs, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Um, in the center of the axon, this part one happens because the, the membrane just ahead of it is also depolarizing. Okay, so we get to minus 60, and then something big happens. At minus 60, sodium channels open. If sodium channels open, sodium comes rushing in, and the membrane potential becomes more positive. So that's number two here. The upstroke is voltage-gated sodium channels open because they've reached threshold. Sodium comes rushing in. Membrane depolarizes. In other words, it goes from being very polar to not as polar, up at plus 30. Now at plus 30, we get another exciting thing that happens. The sodium channels inactivate. In other words, they close temporarily. You could think of it as that. Um, and then more importantly, the potassium channels open. So when potassium channels open, like in our uh, drawing over there, potassium goes rushing out of the cell. So we have a drop in membrane potential from plus 30 all the way down to almost uh, minus 90. So this downward stroke <coughs> is potassium moving through open potassium channels. When we get down to that minus 90, the potassium channels close, and now we have a return to baseline because the sodium channels are closed and the potassium channels are closed. So eventually, this uh, membrane potential is going to go back to minus 70 where it started from. All right? So this picture, which you should know very well and know uh, the, what's moving and creating these changes, <clears throat> is looking at just one piece of an axon. Now, an actual action potential, of course, doesn't happen at just one spot of the cell membrane. It happens in series all along the path to transmit information from the cell body to the end of the synapse. So if we look at the axon in three segments here, so we're going to look at three different pieces. Um, in the initial segment, that's here in step one. So if, if this initial segment reaches minus 60, right, from resting of minus 70, that, that opens the sodium channels. So we get sodium rushing in, which you see here in purple. As the sodium rushes in, the membrane potential shoots up to plus 30. Now, what's interesting is this sodium that has entered, it doesn't stay put. You know, these are um, ions in solution, and they're charged particles, so they're going to move, right? So this sodium, it kind of moves along the inside of the membrane, because here, this is very negative, right? So we've got lots of negatives lined up. The positives are going to be drawn to that. So as they are pulled this way, we'll see that the membrane potential in uh, segment two now is going to change, it's going to go up is going to approach that minus 60, that threshold value. So the sodium that entered in segment one triggers the action potential in segment two and so on down the chain. Because the sodium comes across, causes depolarization, then we get the same effect. Sodium channels open, sodium comes rushing in, that sodium doesn't stay put, it moves to the next segment and does the same thing. So we have this kind of repeating stimulation as we go down the membrane. So the first part of the axon begins this process, but once it starts, it propagates all the way to the end because the <clears throat> each pre-segment depolarizes the next segment. So we call this continuous propagation. Um, this is what happens in unmyelinated axons, okay? Works very well, but it's kind of slow because essentially the entire membrane all the way down that axon has to depolarize. So evolution has given us a, a faster and smarter way to do the same thing. And that's what we call saltatory propagation. This is what happens when there's myelin. You remember that myelin are, um, is a lipid that's been sort of wrapped around the axon like insulation on a wire. But it's not continuous, there are gaps between the myelin sheaths 
and we call those nodes of Ranvier. One of those great words, right? You know, the nodes of Ranvier. <clears throat> and what these, uh, what this system allows to happen, is the sodium that enters here at segment one, it travels along the inside of the membrane, skips this part because the myelin prevents sodium from entering or exiting, right? So the sodium cruises along here and then depolarizes the membrane at the next node or at the next gap in the myelin sheet. <laughs> so same process, segment one depolarizes segment two, two, three, three, four, and so on. But instead of having to depolarize all that membrane in between, it can just skip to the next node. So saltatory means leaping. And essentially what happens here is the action potential leaps from one node to the next until it gets all the way to the end um, at the axons at the end. So this is much faster, <clears throat> but the process is still the same. You know, sodium enters and depolarizes the downstream membrane, which triggers more sodium to enter, which depolarizes the next downstream membrane. So we have those two forms of action potential propagation. All right. So why fire action potentials at all? It's all about the synapse. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about the action potential because the physiology is both simple and well known. Um, and there are many things that affect it. There are lots of medications, for example, that can have uh, both positive and negative effects in this action potential generation. Um, a lot of toxins that animals create affect this system specifically. So like your snake venoms and some mushroom toxins, they shut this system down and effectively make it so the organism can't respond to anything. All right, when we get down to the synapse, so here's our action potential. So this is what we just were talking about. So this membrane is depolarizing. Eventually, it's gonna get to the synaptic knob or the very end point of the axon. And this membrane depolarization triggers the opening of calcium channels. So these are voltage-gated calcium channels. When the voltage changes here, they open. Calcium, just like um, sodium, is much higher outside the cell than inside. So when calcium channels open, calcium comes rushing in. So <clears throat> once that calcium is present inside the cell, the vesicles that contain pre-made neurotransmitter join up with the membrane and dump their contents. So the trigger for the release of neurotransmitter is calcium entering through a, a voltage-gated calcium channel. All right? So let's talk about uh, neurotransmitter a little. Um, neurotransmitters are the chemicals that one neuron uses to communicate with the next neuron. So there's a wide variety of them. In this case, this is a cholinergic neuron because see, we have acetylcholine that's going to be released. But there are lots of other neurotransmitters. You know, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, there's a very, very long list which you certainly do not need to know. But the process is the same even if the neurotransmitters are different. So the, the release um, uh, uh, pathway or cause and effect, the events, are the same regardless of what the uh, neurotransmitter is. So in order for the neuron to be fast and responsive, it has to have already made the neurotransmitter it's going to release, right? We can't have this action potential arrive and then the cell make the neurotransmitter too slow. You know, our nervous system has to be quick. So the um, neurotransmitters are already made. The trigger for release then is that calcium. So the acetylcholine comes out of the cell, crosses the synaptic cleft, that's the gap between uh, the axon and the next cell, so the next um, neuron. That acetylcholine is going to bind to a receptor, and that receptor is going to make something happen. So in this case, acetylcholine is binding to a sodium channel and causing it to open. If that occurs, well, sodium is going to come rushing in, right? So this open channel is going to increase the membrane potential of this next cell. So this would be an EPSP, or an excitatory neurotransmitter, because it creates an excitatory postsynaptic, there we go, so post after the synapse, membrane potential change.
Now, there are lots of different receptors. So just like there are lots of different neurotransmitters, there are lots of different receptor types too. So not all neurotransmitters cause this. Some cause potassium to enter the cell. Some cause sodium channels to close instead of open, or potassium channels to close instead of open. So there's a wide variety of effects there. But in the end, it's, this neurotransmitter is either going to stimulate the, the next cell, in other words, depolarize the membrane, or it's going to um, inhibit the next cell, hyperpolarize the membrane, or, or push it away from minus 60 instead of toward minus 60. All right. And then uh, for acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter is broken down then in the, neurotran in the uh, synaptic space here. Why? So, it does, so its effect is temporary. You know, the nervous system works in time. You know, it doesn't make things happen over a long period of time. It works quickly. So we want to have an effect, but then we want that effect to stop. And one of the ways the body does that is to break down the neurotransmitter so it can't have any effect. And that's by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, at least for acetylcholine. Here again, there are other ways that this is done um, in different kinds of neurons. So like serotonin, for example, um, instead of being broken down, it's taken back up. So the, the cell that, that released it grabs it and pulls it back in very quickly. That's called reuptake. All right. And then the neurotransmitter is remade so that the whole system can uh, uh, be ready to do this again. All right. So events at the cholinergic synapse. All right. So I put this in just to remind you of what it's really like. You know, when we look at these diagrams of neurons, they're usually hyper simplified, right? You've got one neuron and the next neuron. Well, it's not that simple. In the brain, the neurons are hugely interconnected. So one cell body, which is what you're seeing underneath all these um, uh, axons or foot processes, um, can receive inputs from thousands of other neurons. So remember that what it's all about is what the membrane potential is right here at that initial segment, the very beginning of the axon. So if all these neurons, you know, doing different things, if they bring this area to minus 60, there'll be an action potential. If they don't, there won't be an action potential. So we have this idea called summation, that all of the effects of all of these different neurons together are going to determine whether this neuron fires or not. They, that's the lowest level of information processing or decision making that our nervous system does is based on whether these all these stimuli bring this area to minus 60 or don't. All right. So all of those different neurons, some of these are going to be excitatory, some of these are going to be inhibitory. So we give those special names. We have EPSPs and IPSPs. So neuron 1 talking to neuron 2, if that message is excitatory, in other words, trying to get neuron 2 to have an action potential, we call that an EPSP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. And at the, at the uh, membrane of neuron 2, we see an increase in membrane potential, right? Because here's the magic value. We've got to go from here to here to make that action potential happen, all right? So we have uh, EPSPs. <clears throat> if neuron 1's message to neuron 2 is not to fire, you know, to, to make it more difficult to fire, then we'll see a decrease in membrane potential, so moving away from that minus 60. These can cancel each other out, so we get a zero, uh, but more often than not, They'll either um, inhibit a neuron, in other words, make it not fire, or they'll excite a neuron into firing. So all of these conflicting, sometimes conflicting, messages all get summed up, and this neuron will either fire or it won't. All right. All right, so there are two ways you can get a neuron to depolarize. In other words, uh, we know that depolarization to minus 60 is the trigger for an action potential, right? So there's only two paths to that. One is by summing up inhibitory and excitatory changes at that axon hillock to get to the minus 60. The other way is the uh, in action potential propagation 
the next segment is depolarized by the previous segment. So this is just sort of a, a general rule for the whole neuron, is there's only two ways to get to depolarization, IPSPs and EPSPs, or depolarization of the neighboring membrane, like you see in that sweeping action potential. All right. Okay, so that was neurophys in 20 minutes, right? Some other things to review, because these are easy things to, to get, um, I think, um, and I hate for you to miss them. So the uh, nervous system needs help. You know, the neurons are so specialized in what they do that they can't do everything else that cells are normally uh, required to do. So we have the neuroglia <coughs> um, that assists with that. So what makes up the bulk of it, you can see these cells here that have these slender feet that kind of extend out. These are astrocytes. Um, they have feet that surround capillaries, and then they have feet that um, surround the nerves themselves. And they act as kind of helpers. Um, they help the neurons with the metabolic work of staying alive and, and having energy to use and things like that. The astrocytes also make up the blood-brain barrier, right? So here's a capillary, and you can see that these feet have this capillary entirely enclosed. Well, this uh, creates a barrier between things in the bloodstream getting out into the nervous system. So many medications don't enter the brain at all because of this blood-brain barrier. The astrocytes with their feet covering the capillaries and then the capillaries themselves are a little different too. They don't have any spaces between the cells. The cells are all locked together so that nothing can get in between them. So are the astrocytes all myelin too? No, the astrocytes don't do myelin. The astrocytes just do feet here and feet here. All right, so astrocytes. Microglia, that's these guys here. They're sort of free floating, free moving. They're the cleanup crew. So they're always gobbling up anything that doesn't belong. So they serve the role of phagocyte, which you may have heard that term before, and you'll hear it more next semester too. Um, but they're cleaning things up. The ependymal cells are here. They create cerebrospinal fluid. Um, so they're found mostly in the ventricles uh, where CSF is produced. And then um, these guys, these cells here, uh, they are wrapping around axons. Those are called oligodendrocytes, and they create the myelin sheets in the central nervous system. Now, in the peripheral nervous system, there's a different cell that does that, and that's the Schwann cell with two ends. So the Schwann cell produces myelin in the peripheral nervous system, the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. All right, so I think that's all. Okay, so that's neuroglia. All right, little spinal cord review. Spinal cord, uh, a lot of it's anatomy. You know, the, it's, the spinal cord is sort of boring, but its anatomy is so rigid that it gives us a lot of information about things. So um, this is the back half. So this is the posterior side. This is the front side. How do you tell the difference? The front side has this big fissure in the front. So you can orient yourself that way. Now, there aren't pictures on this exam, though. So um, just so you know that too. Not that you don't have to know this information, but there's not pictures to test you on. All right. All right. So the back half of the spinal cord um, is all sensory. So this is information coming in, right? The front half of the spinal cord is all motor. So this is information going out. So the afferent branch is in the back and the efferents are in the front. All right. So coming off the back of the spinal cord, um, we have a uh, what we call the dorsal root. So this is carrying sensory information, right? Because the whole back half of the spinal cord is sensory. It makes a stop in this dorsal root ganglion, and then it joins with the ventral root to form what's called the spinal nerve, all right? So then in the front, we have a ventral root that's carrying motor information. So these are commands to muscles, for the most part, anyway. Um, and they, the ventral root and dorsal root join together. So this spot right here is what we call the spinal nerve, okay, which is mixed. It has both sensory from the dorsal and motor from the ventral. 
So the spinal nerve then splits into a dorsal ramus that heads towards the back and the ventral ramus, which then comes around towards the front. So because most of the human being is in front of the spinal cord, the ventral ramus is always much larger and carries more nerve fibers and more information. All right. And then um, coming off of the spinal nerve is the uh, sympathetic ganglia, which we didn't talk a lot about, um, but this is where your sympathetic nervous system has its, uh, its first synapse, so it's, um, uh, which we'll talk more about in a minute because I got a better picture. All right, so know that anatomy, because it's pretty simple, I think. You know, dorsal root, ventral root, come together, spinal nerve, dorsal ramus, ventral ramus. Dorsal root carries sensory information, ventral root carries motor information. All right, then we get into the brain. All right, and like I said when we talked about this, you can't get very <laughs> in-depth about the brain without things getting really complicated really fast. So we kind of took a... a 10,000 foot view of it, um, but the basics you should still know. You know, like the descriptions on this slide, which is right out of your book, um, these are worth knowing because they're nice and simple. You know, what does the cerebrum do? What does the thalamus do? What does the hypothalamus do? The, and this is important to know, not just for the exam, but this is the foundations of um, neurology and neuroanatomy. So knowing what the different parts of the brain do is, is uh, critical. All right. We divide up the brain into lobes. So occipital, parietal, temporal, and frontal. Each one of those lobes has um, a particularly important function. All right. So the frontal lobe, its uh, particularly important function is that that's where the motor cortex is. So this is the part of the brain that controls skeletal muscle. And it's found in what we call the precentral gyrus. So at the top of the brain, there's kind of a split called the central sulcus. The gyri, or uh, uh, lumpy thing, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, that's just in front of that sulcus, that's the motor cortex. The parietal lobe has the sensory cortex. So they sit right next to each other. The postcentral gyrus is the sensory cortex. The precentral gyrus is the motor cortex, right? So what about the other two lobes? Well, the occipital lobe has the visual cortex at the back that, that creates our sense of vision from what the eyes bring. And then the temporal lobe has the auditory cortex, sort of right there in the middle. So the frontal lobe controls skeletal muscle. The parietal lobe controls sensation. Um, the occipital lobe, vision. The temporal lobe, auditory. Okay, so the sort of four claims to fame of the four different lobes. Now, there are a lot of other things that these different parts of the brain do too, but we're keeping it simple because the brain gets too complicated too fast. All right. An association area is just, it's a thinking area, so to speak. So if the visual cortex is the screen, like you're looking at here, the visual association area is making sense of what's on it. You know, same with uh, motor, you know, in order to do an action, you have to plan it and coordinate it, right? So that's what the association area does. It does the thinking for the doing of these primary cortex areas. All right. Okay. And then the um, autonomic nervous system. This is one, I, and I told you at the time, spend some extra time with the autonomic nervous system because it, it isn't complicated as much as it's very similar information. In other words, the differences between them are significant, but they can get all mucked up in your head because a lot of them are opposites. So I think this is a particularly good summary slide, so you might want to mark this one, in, because this is right from your book, so you might want to flag it to maybe look at even just before the exam so that you know you've got it all straight. All right, so we have sympathetic and parasympathetic. Both have a ganglia, you know, in the, um, uh, for the autonomic nervous system, it goes neuron, ganglia, ganglia, effector, right? It's a two-step chain. So we have a pre-ganglionic neuron, and then we have a post-ganglionic neuron or post-ganglionic fiber, right? And there are significant differences in the two. One is the, the fiber length. So for the sympathetic, 
We have short preganglionic fibers because the ganglia are found near the spinal cord. In the parasympathetic, we have long preganglionic fibers. Um, and that's because the parasympathetic ganglia are found in or near the target organ. So here we have distant from the target organ. Here we have very close to it. So short preganglionic, long preganglionic. And then the opposite is also true. So the postganglionic fiber in the sympathetic system is long, and in the parasympathetic is short. So we have an opposite situation. Now at the uh, ganglion here, so preganglionic, postganglionic, right? We have the same neurotransmitter and the same receptor type. So in both the sympathetic and parasympathetic, at the ganglia, it's acetylcholine nicotinic receptor for both systems. Now for the second synapse, at the end of the chain, we have different neurotransmitters. So for the sympathetic system, we have epinephrine and norepinephrine. For the parasympathetic, we have acetylcholine again. Um, for the parasympathetic, there's only one receptor type, and that's muscarinic. Uh, muscarinic receptors uh, can be either um, stimulatory or inhibitory, but there's always acetylcholine, always muscarinic receptors. For the sympathetic division, we have more complexity than that. It's all neuro, uh, um, norepinephrine, but there are three, there are five, sorry, five different receptor types that do different things, which we'll talk about more in a second. So neurotran or, uh, norepinephrine, acetylcholine. And then also part of the sympathetic system is the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland acts like a giant ganglionic neuron, but instead of releasing epi and norepi at a synapse, it releases it into the bloodstream. So it acts just like this, only its source or its uh, endpoint isn't the target organ directly. It goes into the bloodstream and then the bloodstream carries the epi and norepi everywhere. So the adrenal gland is like a modified um, sympathetic ganglion. All right. Some other differences. Uh, origination. The sympathetic system comes from the thorax and the lumbar regions of the spinal cord. So we call it the thoracolumbar system. The parasympathetic comes from the cranial nerves and the sacral nerves. So we call it the cranial sacral system. All right. And then what do they do? Uh, fight or flight, rest and digest. So their um, actions are opposite. You know, the sympathetic system is going to get the body ready to maximally perform. The parasympathetic system is going to get the body to heal, rest, and grow. So they sort of do opposite things. All right. The receptors for the sympathetic system are probably the, the most detailed part of that whole chapter. So there's five types. There's two alphas and there's three betas. Um, alpha receptors uh, um, are found um, widely in the cell or in the body, but their biggest claim to fame is they're found on vessels, so on our arteries in particular and veins. Um, the alpha-1 receptor is uh, stimulatory. So it causes an increase in blood pressure by shrinking arteries, making the pipes smaller. Alpha-2 receptors are inhibitory. They make the pipes bigger. So alpha-2 receptors we find in skeletal muscle. Alpha-1 receptors we find everywhere else. So in a fight or flight scenario, you want all the blood going to your skeletal muscles, right? So you can fight or flee. And that's what this system allows. Alpha-1 constricts blood flow to everywhere but the muscles. Alpha-2 increases blood flow to the muscles. All right, so alpha-1, alpha-2. Uh, the beta receptors, beta-1, there's one heart and two lungs. So the beta-1s are found in the heart. The beta-2s are found in the lungs. The beta-1s are stimulatory, just like the alpha-1s. The beta-2s are inhibitory, just like the alpha-2s. So both 1s are inhibitory, both 2s are, or sorry, both 1s are stimulatory, both 2s are inhibitory. Um, the beta-2 receptors in the lungs causes uh, bronchial dilation. So it makes the tubes carrying air into the lungs bigger. Um, so that allows more oxygen in, which fuels that fight or flight scenario. So if you remember, the purpose of this system, a lot of times you can work out, you know, what 
which receptor type must be doing what. All right. And then the last one is the most recently described one. That's the beta-3 receptor. And it causes uh, adipose tissue to release fatty acids. So basically, it triggers um, an increased fuel supply for the skeletal muscles that are going to fight or flee on, on the brain's behalf. All right. So by receptor types. Okay. Questions about any of those things? Anything else you want me to go over before we do some questions? No? Okay. So we'll start with a neuroglial question. Um, a neuroglial cell that is a major component of the blood-brain barrier is which of those things? And I'll have it out to you in just a second. Is that everybody? All right, so astrocyte is the blood-brain barrier maker. Astrocytes also help neurons with um, the metabolic work, so like ATP production, um, metabolism, essentially. Microglial cells are macrophages, so they clean things up. Oligodendrocytes produce um, myelin in the CNS, and then ependymal cells make uh, cerebrospinal fluid. All right. Gaps or interruptions in the myelin sheath are called what? Got a tight race between two answers. All right, that's. I think that's everybody. All right, and the winner was E gap junction, which is not correct. The the interruptions in the myelin sheath are the nodes of Ranvier. Don't forget about Dr. Ranvier and his nodes. So those are the spaces in between the myelins. A lot of people put gap junctions. Why? Because it sounds like it's correct, right? But the gap junction is a, a, a cell to cell connection that allows um, stuff from one cell to pass directly into another. So you're going to hear more about gap junctions in the um, heart chapter next semester um, and in the digestive uh, chapter. But gap junctions allow stuff to go from one cell to the next. Nodes of Ranvier are the spaces in between the myelin. All right. White matter is composed of which of those things? You should have gotten to see the white matter in the sheep brain that we did. All right, jump in there, last few people. There we go. All right, so the entire brain is made up of white matter and gray matter. Same with the spinal cord. There's white matter and gray matter. Gray matter, while it's boring to look at, is where all the interesting stuff happens. Because gray matter is cell bodies. And it's at cell bodies that we get the information processing, right? 
you know, where uh, does those excitatory and inhibitory stimuli, you know, where do they happen at the cell body? So the white matter is just myelinated axons. So it's nerve fibers going somewhere. They're either going out to the body, coming back in from the body, or going from one part of the brain to the next. So um, white matter is always uh, myelinated axons because what makes it white and kind of stiff, like I hope you found in um, the sheep brain lab, is myelin is sort of stiff um, and rubbery. So we get that uh, characteristic from it. All right. Depolarization of the nerve cell membrane occurs when there's a rapid influx of which of those things? <laughs> Very good. I'm very proud of you all. D, sodium ions. Okay, you're getting some of the neurophys stuff. Good. Almost all of you got that in rather quickly. So yes, depolarization is sodium ions coming rushing in. The other uh, repolarization or hyperpolarization is potassium. And it's because potassium is rushing out. So it takes positive charge out with it. So very, very good. All right. Which of the following events is not a characteristic of an action potential. This is a reading question, so I'll give you time. That's everybody okay. So let's do them one at a time. So A, plasma membrane becomes highly permeable to sodium ions and depolarization results. Yes, that's the upstroke, right? So when we go from minus 60 and we shoot up to plus 30, that's because sodium ions are rushing in, depolarizing the membrane. All right, B, as sodium ions enter, the inside of the plasma membrane becomes more negative. No, it becomes more positive. That's depolarization. As sodium brings its positive charge in, the membrane inside becomes less and less negative or more and more positive. All right, so the correct answer there is B. Uh, C, at the peak of depolarization, sodium channels um, close and potassium channels open. Yes, that's what makes the curvy part at the top because the sodium channels close and then the potassium channels open, so now it's going to go back down again. Uh, positive charge goes rushing out in repolarization. And yes, action potentials are all or none. All right. Which of the following statements regarding voltage-gated potassium channels is true? Is not entering the cell? No, it's leaving. 
test is needed to sell. Uh -huh. <clears throat> all right, so the correct answer here is E. All those things are true. Um, so uh, have only one gate. What the question is getting at is sodium channels are a little different than potassium channels because sodium channels have two gates. They have an inactivation gate, and then they have a, a, a closed gate. So we didn't get into that level of detail, but that's what they're getting at. Um, they are more slow, so the potassium channels open a little slower. Um, <clears throat> yes, until repolarization is complete, potassium is going to be leaving the cell. Um, and obviously, these channels are specific for potassium. All right, so if you, even if you didn't know A and B, because C and D are both correct, and you know E has to be the case. So a, a little good test-taking strategy there, too. All right, we'll do a couple more. Saltatory conduction um, of an action potential means which of those things? So when you think saltatory conduction, think nodes of Rondier, right? So it's the, the action potential leaps from one node to the next, and it greatly increases the speed at which that action potential can propagate. Because remember, some neurons are not trivially small things. You know, there's, for example, there are neurons where the cell body is in the end of your spinal cord, and they end at your big toe. You know, so you're talking about a three-foot long axon, right? So when you get that kind of distance, you need to have some way to speed that process of conduction up. All right. We'll do one more. The conus medullaris. Where do we find that, or what is that? few people. So obviously there will be much more on the exam than what I was able to cover today. I just tried to hit the hard spots that I think sometimes students struggle with. This is a classic anatomy question. The conus medullaris is the end of the spinal cord, um, and it ends in the term, uh, phylum terminale that then anchors the spinal cord to the base of the sacrum. So the answer here is B. It's a tapered cone-like region just underneath the lumbar enlargement. All right, I will post this uh, after class, and I'll see you all.